your questions answered today on Southeastern Style covering all things SEC. You guys asked a bunch of questions and I'm excited to answer them. A lot of topics. Basketball season for the SEC is over now. We turn our attention back to football with spring games coming up real soon. There's some questions about that, but also some questions about the basketball season. A lot of busyness going on with the SEC. Alabama got knocked out in Sweet 16. Arkansas got knocked out in the Elite Eight. The National Championship is now set between Gonzaga and Baylor, but we're going to talk some SEC sports. I really like the questions, as I said, and I'm looking forward to answering them. So this is Southeastern Style. I'm Carson, and thank you for joining today. Let's start out with the first question I've got. Is Texas A&M the second best team in the SEC West slash what are the SEC West power rankings? So two kind of questions here. So it's A&M's second team in the SEC West. Look, there's a lot of questions. Current last year, yeah, of course. But going into this season, there's a lot of question marks at Texas A&M. If you want to hear more about that, you can go back and watch the Save the Program A&M episode that I do, uh, did or listen to that episode and you can get a bigger breakdown. Of course, I'm going to talk about them more coming up when I continue the spring game breakdowns. But, but A&M, I would say the way they're recruiting and what they've got coming back, they're still recruiting very well offensive line-wise. They have one of the best offensive lines in the SEC. They lost a lot of those guys. They're still bringing in some top talent. Quarterback situation, not sure exactly what's going to happen there. But I'd say they're, I believe they're still the second best team in the SEC West going into this next season. A lot of question marks at a lot of places. And so I, going into the season with the talent that's still going to be there, the way they're recruiting right now, I think A&M is the second best team in the SEC West. Where it gets tricky is after, after number one and two with Alabama and A&M, in my opinion, you start getting into a lot bigger arguments. A lot of people now in the SEC West want to put Ole Miss and Arkansas up there, you know, LSU, Auburn, uh, Mississippi State, kind of, you, you don't really know. Of course, I've shared my thoughts on Mississippi State, not huge on them at the moment. Ole Miss has the most returning as far as talent goes, Matt Crow returning. More than likely, I'd put them at number three. I'd probably put Auburn at four and Arkansas at five if I was going to go in that order, uh, order just because of what Ole Miss has returning. I know a little bit more about them. Continuity, Auburn with a new head coach, LSU, a lot of drama going on there that I'm going to address here in just a second. So, I would say that would be the power ranking Mississippi State at the very bottom of the SEC West. So shifting a little bit to SEC East, I uh, got a question. How long will it take for Tennessee to get back? <laughs> this is a tough question. It's not going to be easy to answer. I honestly hope that Tennessee is able to get back under Josh Heupel. But I can also say I'm not extremely confident they'll be able to. It's a mess, and we don't. We still don't know the total ramifications are going to be from this Jeremy Pruitt mess that happened with and the trouble with the NCAA. We we don't know that yet. And if they get big time scholarship reductions, and if they get hit hard in a number of ways, it could be detrimental to this program, setting them back another five years or so. Tennessee currently still does not have a commit for for the I believe it's the uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2023 class. So they're really Really a little bit, and again, that's not this class, but the next one. But still, you usually do have a couple commits for for the uh, upcoming class. So it's not not ideal situation for Tennessee. Look, I think Heupel is a great offense in mind, but to be honest, I'm not really confident in him. I don't know, you know, I, of course I've watched UCF, but I'm really, I don't know a whole lot about him, is what I'm saying. And so how he's going to do, I don't know. I think he's hired a solid staff at, at Tennessee, some guys with SEC coaching experience. So I really do hope for Tennessee's sake that it goes well, but a lot of question marks. I'm going to say it's going to take a few years, and Tennessee can't have the coaching change really fast again. They've got to give him time. They've got to give Heifel time to establish the recruiting basis. Look, Pruitt was recruiting well, but he got into, into trouble. So look, Heifel, you got to be able to recruit in the SEC. If he can recruit well, get the athletes in there, I think he has a, runs a good system of offense, play defense. I, I think they can be a... A good team down the road, but it's going to take some time, and they got to. You've got to reinvent yourself. You got to resell your program because you look at you know Tennessee back in the '90s. They were they were the stuff. You know they they, they had they were the big brand, but the generation now, guys like my age, because you know I'm I you know I'm a guy that's around these uh, age of recruits now. I I'm a junior in high school, so 
guys that are my age don't know about the dominance of Tennessee football. I wasn't around to see that. I was too young. I was not born yet. And so, you know, or I was getting born right as it was kind of coming to an end. So all I know is Tennessee football that's been poor all my life. So these guys don't know about the history and tradition of Tennessee football. So you've got to reinvent, you've got to resell Tennessee football if you're Josh Heupel. You've got to show what this history is, this tradition is, and, and you've got to change it up a little bit because that may not work with recruits now. We've seen this with Miami. Multiple different type of programs have, have had to reinvent themselves. Tennessee's going to have to do that, in my opinion, to get back. And then staying on NCAA investigations, got a question, what will be the fallout at LSU? I assume this person's referring to the Darius Guy situation with the with the sexual misconduct, Title IX type of stuff. This is I don't I, again I've stayed kind of away from this because it's very controversial. We still don't know a lot about the situation, so I don't want to speculate. Investigation is ongoing, but if it comes out that Ed Orgeron, like the claims have been made that Ed Orgeron has knowledge, had knowledge of this situation, didn't act on it, we know that everything that's already happened with Les Miles. You know, they're not going to get punished for that at this point. He's gone, done for. But if Ed Orgeron had knowledge that this took place while he was head coach, it's not going to end well for LSU, and it could end in a loss of his job. So whatever comes out of this investigation, it could be really bad if these things are proved to be true, if the allegations are, are true. Um, but the NCAA is investigating, LSU is investigating. So we just don't know enough yet. But this has the potential to be Baylor type of bad, in my opinion, if it does come out that Ed Orgeron uh, didn't know about this situation. And Coach O really just, he, uh, not on this topic, but kind of veering away from, from this a bit, in his comments on hiring a coaching staff, I just want to get into this because this was really something saying he didn't even interview some coaches before he hired him and how he took back control. Really probably not something you want to say, Coach O. Probably don't want to say that. Yeah, I just kind of hired these guys without interviewing them. And, you know, I, I don't like the state of LSU football. I'm going to say that. And I really have tried hard to hold off judgment on Coach O. He won a national championship. But there's a lot of comparisons after this past year that, that Coach O, like another Gene Chizik, really just kind of had, really ran in, got a really good player, had some really good assistants around him, so he kind of lucked into winning a national championship. I don't think you luck into winning a national championship, but I do think some subpar coaches have won them. But I don't want to make the comparison yet to Gene Chizik, but if Ed Orgeron can't get things turned around here at LSU, it, it could he could be headed down the same path. So we'll see, but I don't like where things are headed at LSU right now, not just with the NCAA uh, allegations, but also with as far as just some of Coach O's comments as of recent. We'll see what happens again. It, it, you know, coaches, everybody's going to say, it, everyone says something dumb in their life that, you know, multiple things. You're going to say a lot of things dumb that, that you probably regret saying at times, and I think Coach O probably won't regret that statement now. But we'll see again. LSU still got plenty of talent. Miles Brennan returning at quarterback. They have a chance to be a good team this upcoming year. We'll see if they're able to. I like this question a lot. This is asking, will Dan Mullen win a national championship at Florida? Dan Mullen, I'll just be honest. I'm not a huge fan of, of, of Dan Mullen. He's a great offensive mind. Great offensive mind. Don't get me wrong. And he's a little bit different. I think most people would admit that. But that's okay if it works. And, it, and I think it does work for Florida. I'm just not sure. There's something about national championship winning coaches a lot of times, and I'm not sure he has that in his DNA. He, he's a guy that can win a lot of games, but does he have what it takes to win a national championship? I don't think so. I really don't. I do not think he'll win a national championship at Florida. No, I do not. Can he? Does, does well, Can you win a national championship at Florida? Obviously, we've seen it done. Can he do it with the way he's recruiting? Yes, he's recruiting very well. He has the talent to do it. But will he? I don't think so. I think he's going to come up just short. I think his 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 threshold may be the playoffs. It may, he may get there if he wins the SEC East. It's just going to. I, I just don't see him winning a national championship. If he's there past Nick Saban, I still don't see him winning a national championship at Florida. He his personality just does not strike me as a as a guy who has what it takes to take his team to the highest level. I think he can get him to a very, very high level, but not to the tip top of the totem pole. That's why I, 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 I think he can 
really he has improved Florida already, and I think he'll continue to to um, move them forward. I'm interested to see how he handles this change. You lost the you lost your quarterback. How is this offense going to adjust? You had a you had a very pass heavy offense with Kyle Trask. It's going to probably be back to his roots and running the ball more with Emory Jones. I like the way he was able to adapt to his players. That's very key to success. I have to give him credit for that. Just saying, overall, just don't think he has enough to be a national championship winning coach. And then I have a uh, question about, somebody said, thoughts on Nick Saban's evo evolution comments. So if you didn't watch the video, you can look it up. But basically, Nick Saban was talking in an interview about how he had to evolve as a coach, how the offenses had to evolve, how the game of college football has evolved. And he talked about when he brought in Nick Saban. And he realized that he had to score points now to win. He couldn't just hold, he couldn't just play defense and expect to win national championships and, and expect to win the SEC. He said, based on the rule changes and how things are now with the way you can run the hurry up, the RPO, the rules of lineman downfield, those kind of things forced him to adapt. And that's what that's what great coaches do. They adapt. And that's why Nick Saban's the greatest of all time. Nick Saban would love to play a defensive stalemate. And, and win like that. But he knew I'm not going to be able to continue to be dominant in college football if I don't evolve. He lost, and, and really where well, you see the change after 2013 season, lost to Auburn in the Iron Bowl, but it was more games than that. that you know, Alabama was starting to fall behind, quite honestly. And he realized, okay, I've got to go bring in somebody that I may not be the biggest fan of in Lane Kiffin, that he's not usually my MO type of coach. But he brought him in because he knew that's what's going to bring me continued success. He did that. Alabama has had success ever since. And, they, and they've been the best offensively after being one of the best defensive teams in college football uh, for the start of Saban's tenure at Alabama. Now they've become one of the best offenses in college football. It, it's the mark. It's really, again, it's the reason why he's the greatest of all time because he wasn't stubborn in his ways. A lot of coaches are. Like, a lot of coaches are, this is my way, my way, or the highway. Uh, we can win like this no matter what. You've got to have some of that, but you've also got to be able to concede some points and be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to have to do this. I don't, I don't like it. It's not what I want to do, but I know if I want to win, I've got to do this. And now a question about Auburn. Had a lot of Alabama and Auburn questions here through these final few, about five or six questions here. So, how many games will Auburn win in 2021? I don't like to give predictions this far away, but just I'm not trying to go too deep here. Again, we'll talk, talk more about Auburn a little bit later on in the spring game, uh, get that get to that breakdown. But Auburn, I think, is going to take some time for Brian Harson. It's going to be a little bit of a rebuild. So if I had to guess seven or eight games, I think it'll be a fairly mediocre season in 2021 as Auburn looks to as Ryan Harson looks to establish his culture in Auburn, it's going to take some time, in my opinion. So, thoughts on Alabama basketball 2021? I'll take some time on this question because Alabama had a phenomenal, phenomenal team this this season, and and it was a heartbreaking loss to a UCLA team who really played very good basketball and almost knocked off Gonzaga. So, nothing Alabama should be ashamed of. They could have beaten anybody if they had shot like they shot against Maryland throughout the tournament. They had a cold night, and, un and unfortunately for them, that ended in a loss. But Alabama, man, a tremendous season. And here's the deal. That was only NATO's second season as Alabama's head coach. They're not going anywhere. And a lot of these guys, look, you're, Alabama's going to have transfers just like everybody else. You guys transferring out, they're also going to have transfers in. So the roster's going to look a, probably a lot different. But looking at it currently, a lot of those guys are going to be returning. Yes, you're going to lose lose a key player, SEC player of the year in Herb Jones, and you're going to lose John Petty and uh, Alex Reese, but you're going to return some really good players. You're going to more than likely return Keon Ellis. Uh, Quinterly will we'll see. Shackle, Quinterly may declare, but Shackleford. Uh, you're going to get a lot of guys back. And so this Alabama team, along with J.D. Davidson coming in and the transfers that come in, and this could be, a, it's a bright future still for Alabama basketball. But just staying a little bit more on this team this year. First in the SEC, and it wasn't even close. They won the SEC regular season by multiple games and won the SEC tournament. It's, it doesn't happen very often. It was very impressive. 
So again, a very talented team. Alabama fans should be ecstatic. Alabama basketball is back, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So congratulations to Alabama basketball, and Alabama fans uh, have a lot to look forward to in the future. And staying on that, um, I had a question. Is Nate Oates going to North Carolina? No. Nate Oates is not going to North Carolina. There was a little bit of talk about Indiana uh, as well. Alabama did a good job tying him up. They gave him a big contract. A buyout would be huge. Alabama has found their man, the blue-collar approach that Nate Oates goes with. He, he, he's, a, he's been a tremendous hire. He's not going anywhere, and so this Alabama program, as I just said, isn't going anywhere. But an interesting fact here that, um, that I, I've read, that North Carolina, there is another SEC coach in North Carolina may interview, and that's Vanderbilt's head coach, Jerry Stackhouse. Personally, I find it unlikely that they would hire him, but there is a chance, according to what I've read, that they could give him an interview, a former North Carolina player, Vanderbilt's really struggled. Now, Jerry Stackhouse really had to bring this Vanderbilt program back from the ground, build it from the ground up. It's really struggling. Vanderbilt has the chance because they're, they've had some really good basketball teams. They can get back there, but it's going to be really tough. He's got to continue to work there. They really have not been successful, though. This, this year was his third year, so I don't understand the draw besides Stackhouse being a former NBA guy, former North Carolina player, the draw to North Carolina. I don't believe they will hire him. But I thought that was an interesting tidbit of information there. But no, as far as Nate Oates goes, he's not going to North Carolina. Alabama has him on lockdown. And to answer this for Auburn fans, I know Bruce Pearl is also not going to North Carolina either. I've not heard, read, or heard his name mentioned at all there. Too many, too many other factors play into a role there. So I, I don't see an SEC coach going anywhere this year. We haven't even uh, had an SEC coach fired now. We'll see. That could change, but at, at, at the moment. So that's good for stability in the SEC. So here's a question about Georgia football. How good will JT Daniels be next year, and how will he compare to other SEC quarterbacks? JT Daniels has the chance to be the best quarterback in the SEC. I don't think he just has the chance. I think he should be the best quarterback in the SEC next year if he plays to his full potential. Over half, over half of the the SEC will have a new quarterback, or yes, a new quarterback next year. And a lot of teams will have quarterbacks who didn't even play a whole season last year. I think of guys like like Will Rogers, um, who who you know didn't play a whole season. You do have only a few that are that will be full time that played pretty much the whole year. Connor Bayside didn't even start the whole year at Missouri, but he played the vast majority of it. Um, and then uh, Bo Nix will be a full time was a full-time starter. He's a returning uh, starter as well. So just, there's there's really not, there's a lot of new faces. Guys we've heard of, KJ Jefferson, Emory Jones, Arkansas and Florida um, there, but there's still, there's a lot of new new faces, new starters. We don't know who's going to be got Tennessee or A&M yet and uh, uh, other places as well. Bryce Young going to be a new starter at Alabama. So a lot of question marks are not Matt Corral's returning at Ole Miss, and that is the one that majority of people would pick to be the be the best quarterback at the SEC next year because he's a returning starter. Honestly, he should be, but I think JT Daniels has the best potential to be. He played really well at the end of the season when he became the guy at Georgia. I think it's going to be between him and Matt Corral for the one and two, but I think JT Daniels has more potential to be the best quarterback and to really set himself up to be probably one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL draft after this upcoming season. So I like JT Daniels a lot, and I think he will have a really good year this upcoming season, and he'll fit well into this offense at Georgia. And then to, to finish out, got two different questions about Auburn, one starting with football and one about basketball. So where does Brian, Brian Harson rank among other uh, SEC coaches? So Brian Harson, if you look at just overall winning percentage over the last uh, some odd years, can't remember exactly. Brian Harson ranks third behind Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney. That was at Boise State, obviously, but the guy knows how to win. You got to be able to. You got to know how to win, even if you're at a in, in a lesser conference. So Brian Harson knows winning football. He has his culture. 
that he has built. I don't think anybody can deny. I don't. I don't think anybody would deny that he's a good football coach. But you got to be able to recruit in the SEC. You cannot win without the talent, the four and five star guys. Yes, you got to get guys who, who will fit your scheme, fit your system. <clears throat> but you've also got to have talent. So where would I rank him right now? That's a tough. It's tough because we haven't seen him coach in the SEC yet. So I wouldn't rank him in the top echelon quite yet. Just I wouldn't rank him with the Nick Saban, with the Kirby Smart, with the Dan Mullen, Jimbo Fisher yet. I'd rank him in tier two. That that's more if you're going to wide tier one. Technically tier one, in my opinion, just be uh, Nick Saban and Kirby Smart. Then I'd probably go uh, a a Dan a Dan Mullen, Jimbo Fisher tier two, and I'd probably go if I was going like that a Harson in tier three with current you know with the with the Lane Kip in there, something something like that in, in Tier 3. So I'd say, but overall, in general, right now, mid-level, can he get to the top tier of the SEC? Yes, but he's just not proven yet. He hasn't coached a game in the SEC yet. But just based on his history at Boise State, that's where I'd rank him currently. Interesting question there, but I like it. And then to conclude, we have an Auburn basketball question. Where does Auburn basketball go now that Shreve Cooper has declared for the NBA draft? Look, a lot of things have changed in Auburn. They've already had three guys transfer out, including Justin Powell and Jamal Johnson, two key contributors on this past season teams. And JT Thor has also declared for the draft with the option to return. Majority of people see him returning, but he may not. Shreve Cooper signed with an agent. He is gone. As with the majority of basketball teams out there because of the new transfer rule, most rosters are going to look different. Completely different. You may have a completely new starting five next year at a lot of teams. That's not going to be the case at Auburn completely. You, but there, there's going to be a lot of changes. Look, you're going to have a lot of guys leave, and you're going to have a lot of guys come in. There's a good chance most schools have – you know, a handful, two, three, four, five guys transfer out and have two, three, four, five guys transfer in. It, it, it's really weird, and I'm going to get into this in, my, in the next episode when I discuss controversial topics, whether this is a good or a bad thing. But for focusing on this question about Auburn, Auburn's got Jabari Smith also coming in, Trey Alexander, two top players. But they're also looking at a couple of uh, specific guys who can come in and play point guard. That's really what they're recruiting hard. Uh, Ty Ty Washington, four-star point guard, high schooler currently coming in, 2021 class. And also, Xavier Pinson, a point guard. Auburn's been communicating, former Missouri point guard in the transfer portal. They've got guys that they believe can come in and possibly play the point to replace Shreve Cooper. But it's going to be hard. You can't replace a guy like that. He was phenomenal, and he, he's irreplaceable. But you at least got to have guys who can fill the position and can distribute the basketball run. The offense Pearl wants to run and can shoot the three. There's also some other names that Auburn has been talking to as well. So I still think the future is bright for Auburn basketball. Like I said, with, with Alabama, with the recruits Auburn has coming in, plus the transfer portal. Obviously, that's a big loss. You're, you're losing a big five-star, but you're gaining another five-star. And Jabari Smith played different positions, but could bring that kind of change to Auburn basketball. So thank you again all for your questions. I really enjoyed answering them. Had a lot of fun doing so. And I hope you all have a, a great week ahead. Thank you.